are you scared? <laughs> Enough to scare anyone, eh? Well, <clears throat> I guess to a certain extent, that's the whole point of this trilogy, is that um, the revelations and the end times is something that is important to all of us. It's not just important for Christians, it's actually for us, it's encouraging, but for those that don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, it is something to be feared. And so it's important for us that we address these subjects because in all fairness, the whole of history is heading towards a destination. There is an ultimate destiny for the world. We as individuals have a destiny and we can determine our destiny all because of world events. Some world events, particularly for us as Christians, the greatest event in history was the cross, the death and the life, the resurrection of Jesus changed history. And you and I remember that date every time we write it in our calendar. Every time we look at our calendar, we are referring back to our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything in history changed because of that. The first week of this series, we looked at the whole aspect of Paul writing to the, to the Thessalonians was to give them hope for them to understand the facts, to understand what would happen before Jesus would return, to know when Jesus had returned and some of the implications with regard to that. And so the first week we looked at that Christ is coming back and the first people that will meet him in the air are the dead in Christ. And so we looked at that, 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 that they would be the first, and then we who are alive and know Jesus and are following him, are devoted to him, we will then meet those in the air. They're, so there's, it's like two parts. There's the dead in Christ, those that have gone before us, those that we, uh, whom we have loved, and obviously throughout history, that have given their lives to Jesus, they are first, then we are second, yes? And so that's what we looked at. So there's the return, there's the rapture, and then we looked at, quickly, the reunion. In other words, we will be with Jesus. We will be with him. Believers will be with him forever. And we looked at little things like the word Maranatha, which was a greeting for the early church, that they would use this when they greeted one another, because the, that was the glue, and that was their hope in the midst of tribulations, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of hard times, they had a hope. And the hope is that Jesus is coming again. In other words, this world as we see it is not all that there is. There is more to come. There is something for every single one of us to look forward to. Then last week we looked at actually our end times, how that affects us on an individual basis. And so the first thing we looked at was the judgment seat of Christ, so that as Christians, when we meet Christ, we will be judged, but not a judgment for punishment. It was a judgment that, uh, uh, that is for rewards. In other words, the things that we have done, we will be rewarded for. And so there's a great uh, motivation there for every single one of us to want to, to work for Jesus, yet for things that count, for the things that are invisible, uh, that have eternity in their heart. <clears throat> then we, we looked at the fact that what is heaven going to be like? Well, actually, there's going to be a new earth and a new heaven that God is going to create at the end of time. <clears throat> we will never suffer again. There'll be no more pain and no more death, no more crying. Uh, we will live with him forever and uh, that there would be, finally, there would be a final judgment. And uh, we didn't get to cover this last week, although I started in a little bit to address it, but there is the great white throne judgment that, uh, that, is, that is talked about in Revelations. And so um, I just want to kind of finish that off before I move into a quick summary of Revelations. 
And so just quickly is that the great white throne is for those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And uh, John, although he was exiled onto the Isle of Patmos at the time, he says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and uh, he had a vision. That's what revelation means. It means a revelation, a vision of what is to come. And of course, it's all about Jesus' revelation. And uh, one of the things in Revelations chapter 20 and verse 11, it says there, John says this, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, the famous, the non-famous, the wealthy, the poor, whatever different people in different um, statuses of life, whatever different nations of the world, would be there, and he says, they're standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And there's, here's the important part. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's a serious business, isn't it? Yes. So I want you to imagine this, uh, if you can get your imagination going. At the end of time, there is a judgment called the Great White Throne, of which everyone is judged at uh, that don't know Christ, because it's for the people whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So everybody, so let's just, even if you imagine uh, both Christians and non-saved were there, then it's the people that have not got their name in the Lamb's Book of Life, which means every Christian has their name in the, the Bible, so they're not the ones that are going to be judged here. And, uh, and they are thrown into the lake of fire. Now, you, you imagine this on a, on a TV program, world scale of this. You can imagine that, that for... For everyone who is not in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're going to spend time in the lake of fire. So in other words, anyone whose sins are not covered by Christ, for those who have not said yes to Jesus, for those who have not followed Jesus, for those who have not uh, accepted him as Lord and Savior, for those who have, uh, have refused to, to acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior, they are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. That is a reality of horrors. Yes, we can watch a horror movie and we know so often that all that's done is camera work and makeup and all that kind of thing, so we tell ourselves it's not real. But if you've ever lived through an atrocity, and many people around the world are living through some horrendous atrocities, warfare. I mean, even now in Israel, uh, people are, you know, the Palestines are sending bombs over and Israel having to defend themselves, as they have had to do so often through history. And uh, in actual fact, just while I say, Israel itself and the birth of the nation of Israel is part of prophecy. And some of the many things that are happening in Israel are part of prophecy. They're already doing things in Israel in preparation for the end times. They're already preparing to do sacrifices. They're already training in some of these things. It's phenomenal what things are happening. I want to say to you, we are in the end times. We are in the end times like we've never been before. And so it's important for us to understand this. Now, I'm not going to go into all the intricacies of that, but it is important for us to recognize that, we, um, that, that being a Christian, being someone who follows Jesus, has consequences. For us, it has massive consequences that are positive. But for anyone who doesn't choose Jesus, there is consequences for that. Now, for many people, they say, but that's not fair. God's sending us to hell. Well, actually, as I briefly covered last week, actually, it is fair. Because we understand that. If we, have, if we meet someone and they are a liar, we feel that there should be consequences. If somebody murders someone, we think there should be consequences. If someone commits adultery, we think there should be consequences. If someone, you know, um, um, cheats someone or steals from someone, that's why we have the law courts. In every nation of the world, there is some way and some sense of justice. Now, for many of us, we've seen people get away with things and we think that's not fair. Is that not right? 
because we all want something that's fair. I remember talking to someone a number of years ago, and they were talking about a local guy and, um, and, and saying that he was quite a notorious guy. He got saved and uh, done a marvelous work for Jesus. And, uh, but this guy was saying, this guy should have been punished. He should have gone to tra- tra- uh, jail. He should have gone to... Should have been. In other words, even though this guy wasn't a Christian, he understood the principle of justice. So the issue is that every single one of us have broken God's command. Have you, let me ask you a question. Have you ever stolen anything? Ever, no matter how small it might be, have you ever stolen? Have you ever lied to somebody? Have you ever, have you ever lusted after somebody? Have you ever, you know, when you look at some of these things, you think to yourself, well, we've all broken the Ten Commandments. So therefore, for every one of us, we've broken the Lord of God, and the, he is the judge, and he is the one that's going to say, you broke the law, and this is the penalty. So when we come to being not fair, I'll tell you who is, it's not fair, it's for Christians. Because it's not fair that we as Christians, we, our sin is paid for. It's not fair that as Christians that we get to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. That we could say, they, they could turn it because as Christians we get all the benefits. We don't have to pay the price for our sin. Jesus has. That's the way. That's the truth. That's the only way to life is through Jesus Christ. So in other words, fairness is judgment. Fairness is is eternal damnation. It's going to hell. But actually what's not fair is I say yes to Jesus. And under because of him. That's why when we get to heaven and the rewards that we've got, we're going to go, I don't deserve them. I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to have your robe of righteousness. I don't deserve to have peace. I don't deserve to have eternal life. How come I'm here? I don't deserve it. I'm here because of Jesus and only because of him. It is so important for us to do that. And that's why... It's the urgency of us to tell people about Jesus. It's their decision. It's their choice. But let's give them the choice. Let's try with all that we have to rescue people from the edge of a lost eternity. This isn't a game. This is life. And this is eternal life. I'm amazed at how many times when I do funerals, that the people in there that have no interest in Christianity are going to church, they just want to play games or do whatever. And it's amazing, when it comes to a funeral, they wake up. They start to ask questions. Unfortunately for many of them, it doesn't go beyond that. They go back into their normal life. But I want to say to us, It's important that in our relationships, in our contact with people, in the way that we live, that we shine Jesus because their lives depend upon it. This is so important for us. That's why the gospel is good news. It is good news. It means we get to rescue ourselves. We get to rescue others from the great white throne. That's what we want, isn't it? Hallelujah, hallelujah. So, the question is, is which judgment will you be at? It's so important, isn't it? Right, quickly, I want to go into a quick snapshot of Revelation. Okay? Just in the hope that you might get a bit of a framework to understand what's happening When you read Revelation, you have some weird and wonderful beings, creatures that are in there. You know, sometimes when you read it, it can be a bit scary and a bit kind of wondering. You're left kind of thinking, what's all this about? Well, that's what we're going to quickly look at today because there's locusts, there's dragons, there's the beasts, there's the mark of man of 666, there's the 12 stars, the 10 horns, the seven heads, the six wings, the four bowls of incense, two olive trees and a partridge. 
There's everything in there. Yes. Forget Steven Spielberg. This beats him heads down. The problem so often is we don't know how to read it. The problem so often is we don't know what's the framework from what we're reading into it. So today I want to build your faith so that you can see what Revelations is all about. So that you can see the aspects of it. In other words, when God shows us what is to come, which is what Revelations is all about, we can get excited as believers. We can get excited about what God wants to do among us. Amen? So it is important that we, that, we, uh, that we do that. So let me just give you a little bit of the backstory. First of all, it's written by the Apostle John. He's uh, one of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he was the one that, uh, that lived the, the longest. Um, the, he's kind of, you know, obviously one of the original 12, but the, the other 10 um, died for their faith. And you're saying, well, I thought there was 12, yes, because Judas hung himself, so he died, but not for his faith. Um, and so... Uh, they were willing, every one of them, to die for Christ. This is the commitment level that they had for Jesus. And they lived with him and they breathed with him. I want to say to you, the people closest to you know you, don't they? The people, when they get to know you, they sometimes think, I don't like what I see. Yes? And if you're not sure about that, ask your spouse. <laughs> Other things that you don't like, that you maybe didn't notice when we, before we got married. Now, in 95 AD, the Roman emperor at the time um, was making a decree to say, you must worship me. And the early Christians said, we're not going to worship you. And so, as a result of that, and particularly for John, he ended up getting exiled uh, to the Isle of Patmos. And he was in a cave. In fact, you can go and see the cave today. If you get a flight to Israel, you can see, um, well, to, obviously to Patmos, um, you can see the cave that uh, there is in. And the angel visited him, gave him a vision, and, uh, and this was originally sent to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Okay? So in Revelations, uh, so that's the backstory of that's where John was, that's the kind of setting of where he gets this vision. And, um, and so there are just five sections that I want us to look at. <clears throat> and the main thing is, is you've got to get it's all about Jesus. Amen? So are you ready? <laughs> Good. Okay, so the question is, who is Jesus in Revelation? Well, first of all, Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. The theme of Revelations chapters 1 to 3 is Jesus is the beginning and the end, that Jesus is returning soon. Verse 7 says this, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Now, we've said last week, it's not the first return, um, you know, it, it, that, we, we, we talked about that, didn't we, in terms of the, the first one is the dead in Christ rise and then those who are uh, living. And the second time, so the first time he comes, um, he, he comes for his church and the second time he comes uh, back with his church. Does that make sense? Yes. So, lo, lo, he's coming in the clouds and every eye will see him and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. In verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Alpha and Omega is quite simply the A for the Alpha is the, the first letter of the Greek alphabet and Omega is the last letter of the alphabet, which is a little bit like saying A to Z. In other words, he is everything. He, everything compass in him. He is the alpha. He, everything begins in him. Creation uh, came through him. Salvation comes through him. He is the first of all. He is above all. And, uh, and, and he will last forever. He is, he is the one who holds everything. So everything uh, in between, as it were, and, uh, and, uh, is in him. And so we've got to understand that. That's what it's all about. So these first three chapters are, are about him as the Alpha and Omega. His head and hair were white like snow, like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. That's symbolism. Uh, it's not literal. John tells us 
uh, what those stars are in verse 20. And out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword, which is the word of God according to Hebrews. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now, just a little thing in here. John was the one that was known as the beloved disciple. He was the one who would rest uh, on Jesus' lap. He was the one who it says, who Jesus said, whom he loved. There was a special intimate relationship between John and Jesus, even out of all the disciples, that Jesus particularly seems to have loved John, and John definitely loved Jesus, and there was a real close relationship. But this time, when he's, when he's talking, he is not coming as a buddy, he's coming as the Alpha and Omega. He's coming as the one who, who rules and reigns. He's coming as that. Why do we know he's coming in a different way? Because John falls down to worship as if dead. So in other words, John is fearful. John now sees Jesus in a completely different light. Yes? He's not coming thinking, I want to put my arms around you, Jesus, which we can all do from tomorrow, I understand. Um, but but he's, uh, he's, he's, he's worshipping. He's absolutely petrified as a result of this. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus do? He says, then he placed his right hand on him and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. And it's, this is the gospel here. It just says, I was dead. But they, of course, couldn't keep him dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. So we just see here that first thing, that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. The second thing that we see in Revelations chapter 4 to 5, we see Jesus is the Lamb of God. So that's who Jesus is in these chapters. Um, 28 times in Revelation, Jesus is named as the Lamb of God. And so, but this, these few chapters, it's the main theme of those chapters, yes? And it's about Jesus is the lamb who is worthy to open the scroll. Because John had had this vision, and there'd been a scroll, but there was no one found worthy to open the scroll. And John starts to cry, he starts to weep, he starts to get very emotional because there's no one worthy. And then, of course, there's the announcement that, uh, that the lamb of God who is worthy to break the seal and to open it. And so that's the kind of setting that, uh, that, that Jesus is. So we know Jesus is the one who enables this stuff to do. So we see the Lamb of God. Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 and 9, just to quickly there. Then I saw, what did they see? A lamb. Well done. Yeah, and the lamb is, who's the lamb? Jesus, that's right, looking as if he had been slain, slain obviously for the forgiveness of sins, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And they sang a new song, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. And then of course we get the gospel again here. Because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You see that, the gospel just coming through over and over again. Now, Jesus is the Lamb of God, and maybe for some of you might not fully understand the imagery of that. Well, the imagery of Jesus being the Lamb of God and the whole thing of the Lamb of God goes back to the Passover. So the, 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 the audience that John wrote to would have understood this. There was a Jewish um, audience, they understood uh, what was going on. And so they're referring back to the Passover. And in the Passover, that's where uh, Israel are slaves in Egypt. And in their slavery, God promises to deliver them. And so you may remember, but there were a number of plagues that came. Ten plagues altogether that, that, uh, that came on the land, that kind of all sorts of things, rivers turning to blood and uh, locusts in houses and all sorts of things. But in the last one and the end one, um, what they had to, they was going to do is they, God was going to send an angel of death over the whole region. And so the only way you could be spared 
was to have killed a lamb and for the blood to be put on the doorpost and the lintel of the entrance to the house. So when the death uh, angel came and saw the blood of the lamb, it would pass over. That's why it's called Passover. <laughs> yes? And so they would... So that's that would say. So when we talk about Jesus as the Lamb of God, it's referring back to this, the deliverance of Egypt, that for them, they looked to the Lamb, yes, the physical Lamb, but they had that, and some of them, if they couldn't afford a lamb, they didn't have a lamb, they would all meet together in one house and uh, together so that they could have, uh, they could eat the lamb and they could, uh, uh, they could be rescued from that. So this is what it's talking about. And John's um, audience would have understood this, yes, um, that they were spared. And so when it's talking about this, it's talking about salvation. You and I know Jesus as our Savior. He saved us from that. So I hope that the fact that you understand that just as the people were spared at the Passover, here Jesus is the Lamb of God and he's the one who spares us. It's Jesus who spares us from the wrath to come, from the judgment. Yes? So Jesus in Revelation is the Alpha and Omega and he is the Lamb of God. Now, in this next section, which is chapters 6 to 18, it does get a little bit crazy. Because Jesus, in this section, he is the righteous judge in this chapter 6 to 18. That is the main theme of it. Jesus judges righteously. He does it in a right way. Now, if ever you have seen anybody on TV and some prophetic guy a girl, whatever, talking about the end times and some prophecies and going into certain things, you will often find, if they're going into some things, that these are the chapters they're referring to, or they're referring to Daniel. These are the kind of the main, the, the main ones that they, they look at through, yes? And so I just want to give you just a couple of bonus points uh, with regard to this. In Revelations chapter 11, the first uh, couple of verses, it tells us there that the temple in Israel will be rebuilt. So we can look for the rebuilding of the temple, yes? We know that's what's going to happen. There's going to be a reintroduction of sacrifices in the temple because the temple needs to be built for the Antichrist, which, which is Revelation 13, verse 1, and 14 to 16, the verses. Uh, the Antichrist, or referred to as the beast, rises and institutes um, this mark of the beast. They put the mark of the beast on every person, which is the mark of the beast is six. Six, six, that's what he's, he's going to put on us. That's why uh, as Christians so often when we see this around, our eyes open, our ears are alert to what is happening around us, yes? That's why when barcodes came in, we kind of looked what's happening with barcodes and we kind of some said, well, it's grouped in three groups of six. Do you know what I mean? So there's all sorts of things. We, we're looking to some of these things as Christians because they are signs of the end times, yes? So it's understanding that the Antichrist is synonymous with the beast. Now you'll see in these chapters that a woman gives birth to a beast. Now we know some of your leaders are thinking, oh, I've been there. <laughs> Not that kind of beast, okay? This is a real nasty beast, okay, that comes up here, yes? And in, in, in Revelation 13, the Antichrist is killed and then he's raised to life. In Revelations 11, 3 to 13, we see that God appoints two witnesses to perform miracles and to preach. And the witnesses are murdered. And then they're raised to life. Isn't that amazing? So you can understand why some of this stuff going on is hard to understand, isn't it? Yeah? But we've got to keep it in the picture of that Jesus is the righteous judge. That this is about judgment. Yes? So these two guys, yes, that God appoints his witnesses, they can shut up the heavens so that it doesn't rain. Um, they can issue all sorts, sorts of plagues that they want to do all over the earth, yeah? And if someone wants to kill these guys, they have uh, to realize that there's a really cool trick that they have to stop them. Do you want to know what the really cool trick is? 
then read it. <laughs> I'm not going to beg you. I'm going to get you to read it somehow or other, okay? But they've got this really cool trick that's, that's to do with it. So, but basically, don't mess with these two guys. That's the top and bottom of it, yes? And then, of course, many interpret Antichrist uh, in this uh, pa- passage in uh, Revelation 17, verses 12 to 13, that the Antichrist assassinates world leaders and moves towards a one world government. Uh, government. And, um, and, and of course, then in chapter 16, we've talked, verses 16 to 19, we talk about uh, Armageddon and uh, the beast uh, is defeated at the battle there. So just keep remembering that in this period that Jesus is the righteous judge, yes? And for reasons for that, there are three judgments, yes? Three sets of judgments. So the kind of coming sets, because it's not like just one thing, but there's kind of subdivisions of each one. And the first one seal, the uh, first judgment is known as the seal judgments, right? And that has four riders of the apocalypse. The moon turns blood red and uh, there's tremendous bloodshed from war. And a quarter of the world dies from famine, plagues and wild beasts. The second set of judgments is known as the trumpet judgments. In Revelations 8, uh, verses 2 to 9, verse 21, 11 to 15, 19, if you're, if you're following. Hail, this judgment has hail and fire mixed with blood uh, that falls from the, the sky. Poisonous locusts attack. And you want to just read the description of these poisonous locusts. It is horrendous. There's a third of the vegetation is destroyed, a third of sea creatures die, a third of the water on earth is contaminated, a third of the light uh, is lost, and a third of the world is killed. This is a battle. This is, uh, you know, this is the judgments of God. So you've just got to remember, though, in the midst of all this that's going on, people can still repent of their sins. So although the church is gone, they can still repent. I think that's phenomenal, isn't it? The, the mercy of God, even in the midst of this. But a lot of people don't. Most people still carry on regardless. Then there's the third set of judgments known as the bowl judgments. Bowl. This is sores on people with mark of the beast. The water turns to blood, blood and everything obviously dies in it. The sun scorches the people. There's devastating earthquakes and hailstorm with 100 pound hailstorms. Eh? I mean, I've seen some hailstorms in my time. Some of them, they look like little kind of rocks that have come down. But 100 pound ones coming down? Now, of course, a lot of people that listen to this and say, I don't like this part. <laughs> this part's scary. This is rough. This is kind of whatever. And it's not fair. Well, it is fair, as we've said, because it's the judgments of God for the people who deserve it. Every one of us actually deserve to be part of this. So the only reason we get to escape this is because of Jesus. Yes? But this remember, this section is all about him being the righteous judge. Amen? And uh, Revelation 16, verse 5 says, Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments. In other words, you are in your rightful place. You are doing the right thing with these judgments. You who are and who were the Holy One because you have so judged. So we've got Jesus. He is the Alpha and the Amiga. He is the Lamb of God, and he is the righteous judge. And fourthly, in this section, Jesus is the King of Kings. This is Revelations 19 and 20. And so the main theme of these chapters is that Jesus is returning with his church. Yes? Revelations 19 verses 11 says this, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, The good guys always ride a white horse. (laughs) Whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. 
Do you remember John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, yes? And then verse 14, and the Word became flesh, talking about Jesus. And then verse 14, it says here, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, the Word of God, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is the King of Kings and he is the Lord of Lords. He is the master of the universe. He is master of all that he surveys. He created it all into the very galaxies and even though they sent, I was listening on the radio the other day, they've sent this whatever it is, some object that's gone out into, into space and is traveling at whatever speed of light and, 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 uh, and it's traveling and they're expecting it to go millions of, of kind of miles and, and stuff. And what the, the, the whole point of the thing I was listening to was the fact that actually when they were talking about our DNA in our body, that actually that doesn't compare in length to the language and the DNA that God has placed within us. That's the creator God. That's the king of kings. That's the Lord of lords. And so when you're reading Revelations, we need to understand that the person that we are following, the person that we have dedicated our life to, is the king. There's no one above him. He rules, he rules and reigns. And the final section is Revelations chapter 21 and, verse, and uh, ch chapter 22. And this is where Jesus is the bridegroom. And we are... The bride. In other words, Jesus takes his church, his bride, to the heavenly city. Verse 9 of chapter 21 says, One of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, which is the church, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, from God. This is the new heaven and the new earth. Verse 23, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Now, for you ladies, you're probably thinking, awesome, I get to marry a perfect guy. And the guys are going, I'm a guy, do I marry a guy? Well, it's symbolism, yes. Obviously, it's, it's not talking about you're not going to, to, to lose that sense of it because we will neither be male nor female in heaven, but we will be as the church. The church is married to the Lamb, to the King of Kings, to the bridegroom. He is that. And then chapter 22 and verse 17 says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who is say, Come, whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I wonder today, will you come? I wonder today, will you come to the throne of God? I wonder today, will you come to the Alpha and the Omega? I wonder if today you would come to the Lamb of God. I wonder if today that you would come to the righteous uh, judge of all time. I wonder if today you would come to the King of kings and Lord of lords. I wonder if today you would come to be, to, to be in the presence of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. I don't know what you've been living for in your life. But I want to tell you, there is nothing greater than living for Jesus. There's nothing greater than making a decision to follow Jesus. And wherever you are in your life, I believe today that God is wanting every single one of us to respond to his word, to be encouraged by his word, but to say, Lord, come, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come now, wherever you are, I believe God is looking at you today 
you maybe walked in here today with all sorts of worries and concerns and problems and difficulties. You might have been rejected. You might be in pain. You might be in any number of, of, of aspects. But I want to say to you today, if you will come to Jesus, Jesus heals, Jesus saves, Jesus rescues, Jesus changes, Jesus transforms us. Jesus gives us a future and a hope. And it's so important to us. We're living in a world that's trying to do away with God. You know, the amount of funerals I've been to lately of some of my own family, uncles and things, and they've been humanist funerals. And the big thing for me with a humanist is that they have no hope. There's absolutely no hope for them. It's just that's this life and that's it. Well, as we learned in week one, it's not you only live once. But actually, if you're a Christian, you get to only die once. Because we recognize that actually we can die two deaths. The death physically, but if we've never accepted our life of Jesus, we will die spiritually. Our soul will die. We will be lost for all eternity. Today, will you choose, whether you're online today or whether you're in the house today, I want you to make that decision today. And if you make that decision today, just go over to the Connect Point and someone will be with you. We'll pray with you. We'll give you some material. And, uh, and we want to just connect in with you because your journey can take on, your life can be totally transformed in Jesus' name. Amen.